Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2. Today we're going to look at this Amiga 2000 HD. This is one of the two Amiga 2000s I have. And this computer is so unreliable. Last time I was using it, which was several months ago, it was working fine. I broke it out today because I just wanted to check out some floppy disks. I have a bunch of Amiga disks. I just wanted to finally go through them, check what's on them, see if there's anything worth keeping. And if not, then I will reformat them. And I turned this thing on and I was just getting a black screen. Let me demonstrate. Okay, the Amiga is hooked up to the scan converter. And when I turn it on, I get a video signal, 15.73 kilohertz, 59 hertz, but that's it. We just have a black screen. And if we turn it off and on, does the power LED. So it starts dim and that's it. Sometimes it goes dim to bright. Other times it just stays dim. I had a keyboard hooked up to it. And when I hit the reboot sequence on it, it looks like it's rebooting but never anything out of the video here, just black screen with uh, sync signals, but that's it, just black. So this machine, of course, being a 2000, suffered battery leakage. It was pretty bad. I cleaned it up. I had to replace the socket for the CPU, if I recall. And I fixed this more than once. Like I fixed it, it stopped working. I fixed it again. It stopped working. All of the issues have to do with flaky traces around the CPU. This is all from my memory. I have a little note on the side here, which I wrote myself. Clean and test drives. Fix the scan doubler. There's a scan doubler in here. Uh, it has some weird wiring. It's like a nine pin connector. I want it to be 15 pin. SCSI card has errors. Um, let's see, get the Picasso card working. I think there's a Picasso card in here. Or maybe I took it out. Also seems to have a 6810 CPU in here because I think at the time I was out of 6800, so I stuck a 6510 in there and I said mount hard drive, as in probably physically mount a hard drive in here. But I didn't write anything here about it not working. But clearly it's, it's broken right now. So let's crack this open and I'm gonna see if I can fix this thing. So I gotta say, Amiga 2000s are just such a pain because they're hard to work on even. It's like such a huge case. For me, the most reliable Amiga is the Amiga 500. That's because it doesn't have caps that leak like the 600, the 1200, the 4000. And unlike uh, at least the, I think 1200, 4000 and this and the 3000, they all, those machines all have leaky batteries that when they're let go, when they let, when the owners let them get that go too far, it causes so much trouble. The 4000, the, the battery leak is just right by the SIM sockets and that can just cause all sorts of issues. Um, or is that the battery or is it the capacitors? That's, that's both actually. But on the 2000, the battery's right in the front. Ugh, just getting the screws off this thing is, is a pain. Um, the battery, is by the CPU and it just causes issues. <laughs> it really does. It's, if you are lucky and you catch it really early, then, then great. But if you buy one of these and you think it's gonna be a quick and easy fix, unless someone's already done the work, it's not gonna be an easy fix. And really what's even worse is the damage that's caused it's just it can be really catastrophic it's not like it's unfixable but as i said i have fixed this machine more than once and it just breaks repeatedly let's check out what's in this machine so we have an accelerator card so this is the commodore 68 or 30 accelerator card problem with this card though is it doesn't work if the CPU on the motherboard is having issues. It's gotta like start with the CPU on the motherboard and then it hands off to this. That's a real problem. Then I have an A2091 SCSI card with no hard drive. And there is no hard drive even in this thing. There's a SCSI cable connector right there, not going to anything. This has a RAM capabilities. You can add some extra RAM, but there's actually RAM. I think there's RAM on the accelerator card. I can't remember. Then I have, looks like this is a, a Supra 2468 megabyte RAM card. Oh, okay, and next up is the AT Commodore Bridge card. So this is a 286 Bridge card and I definitely made a video about it on the main channel. 
So that is in this machine. So yeah, this machine was definitely working because I'm pretty sure I did the videos on the bridge card on this machine. Now, I don't know if you can even see it, but there's a little board down there and that is the flicker fixer. So it's a scan doubler, plugs onto the chip on the motherboard, I don't know, onto the Denise chip maybe, and it outputs VGA, it doubles the video. But the onboard video still works perfectly. The reason for that being a plug-in module is it allows you to still use a video toaster in the, in the video slot here. Commodore's own flicker fixer went into this slot, just a lot easier to install from the end user, but that one there on the motherboard works in conjunction or, of course, uh, you have an Amiga 500, you could use that as well. All right, well, first thing I need to do is just start pulling all the cards out. I mean, maybe one of these is causing it to not work. I doubt it, though. And there's something else that's frustrating about the Amiga, and I mean, it's such a minor issue, but still annoying. The screws. The screws on this thing are entirely metric, even though this has, like, a PC-looking form factor, like you would think that the screws are, are somewhat normal, especially on like this, the slots back here. They're not, they're metric. You can't use PC screws on this. If you do, it kind of strips out the hole and that's all a bit of a nightmare. So if you get one of these computers that's missing all of its cards, well, you have to look online to find the appropriate screws. So uh, here's the hard drive controller card. Here is the Supra RAM card, only has two megs of RAM installed. Here is the Commodore Bridge card. This is the 286 version. Yes, it is, definitely. It's a nice upgrade from the XT one, which is more common. It says AT emulator, but I can't remember the exact model number of this. I think it's like a A80286 or A2286. That's it, A2286. All right, now to take out this accelerator card. And of course, the screws that are used on this back plate here are also sometimes different. I think this uses some kind of metric screws on there, but I've seen other cards that use like kind of a metal self-tapping looking screw. It's all just kind of random. And um, if you have lost those, like I said, it's frustrating. So this is the Commodore Accelerator. Uh, 6803, 25 megahertz with FPU, four megs of RAM. 32 megs of RAM right there, or 32 bit RAM, I mean. So it's very, very fast. All right, there's the CPU on the motherboard. The battery's normally right there. It's gone, of course, I, I removed it. This slot often gets very damaged. That's the processor expansion slot. The CPU is right there. That often gets damaged as well. I can see that there was a lot of corrosion on this slot. I got rid of the corrosion. Some of the pins are looking worse for wear though. I think what I did is when I took the corrosion off, it exposes the copper uh, underneath the kind of gold plating. So I used a little lacquer and painted along the top just to keep the corrosion at bay. And that seems to have done the trick. I have a note down here that says repaired August, 2020. Well, I'm definitely positive that I've repaired this thing more than once. Okay, before I yank out the power supply disk drive stuff here, I'm gonna turn this thing on, Let's see what we get here. So there's definitely a video signal. And what is happening here? So I remember the problem last time. Yeah, nothing's happening. If I push down on the CPU socket really hard while I turn it on, it would sometimes start to work. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Freaking <laughs> ridiculous. And then if I let go, sometimes it stays running. Other times it will just crash. Oh, so. It is not the CPU socket. I've replaced that before. I can tell there that's a nice machined new socket. Uh, this CPU has never been used in a computer, so it's got really perfect legs. The problem is the PCB. And I've already, boy, to figure out what was going on here, last time, I think if I remove this motherboard and look, we look underneath, there's like 20 bodge wires under there already. I bodged so many connections just to try to get that, that CPU socket connected up. And obviously the corrosion is still at work in there and has made it worse. I'm half tempted to just like install something that just like wedging something on top of the CPU there that pushes down on it. Like that is the crap solution, but that might be the solution that I stick with. First thing I'm gonna do is pop out this CPU here. 
There is the good 60A10, and it looks perfect. No corrosion or anything on all the, any of the pins. And it's a genuine 60A10. This chip was sent in by a lovely viewer as a donation. And right here, there are more. They're not 6810s, these are 68,000s. And they're genuine parts here. So that's from 92, 91, 90. A 16 megahertz version. I won't put that in there, that's a waste. And this one is from 89. How about we use the oldest one, which looks perfect. And I'll stick the 6810 on here. And the really annoying thing about whatever's going wrong with this motherboard is there's no visible damage. Um, there's a little bit of solder mass that's missing right there, but most of the damage was down here in the front of the board, not around the CPU, but there is something going on down there. And it's some kind of impossible to diagnose intermittent connection. When you tone this out with the multimeter, looking at the schematics, every single trace is connected. I spent hours, hours and hours toning everything out and everything looks perfect. But then you put a chip in there and it doesn't boot. It's like, it's ridiculous. And then if you push down on it like I did, then it just magically starts to work. It magically freaking starts to work. When I, if I recall when I was troubleshooting it, I was like toning it out and pushing on it at the same time. Like I, you know, I had the board upside down but I was trying to like bend it. And if I saw any traces that fluctuated at all, then I would bodge over them. And then that seemed to make the thing stable for a while, but it is malfunctioning again. The only thing I'm gonna think I'm gonna try to do is I, you know, obviously these are pin strips of pin headers. These are not just a normal socket. I'm gonna try to solder on the top side. I can see the bottoms there where they're in the holes on the PCB and I might as well just sort of flow some extra solder. Why not? Let's see if this is even doable. All right, well, I did a few and then I kind of gave up. I'm just gonna try to reinstall this socket in, or this CPU in here. Let's see, there we go. Hopefully I got it all in with the right, it's definitely the right orientation. The notch goes towards the front of the computer and everything looks like it's in. Okay, there we go. Let's turn this thing on. Will it work? Will it not work? I am not holding out hope that it's gonna work properly. I'm gonna resort to just wedging something in there. And we have a non-working computer again. Let's try the old wedge trick here. What can I find a wedge in there? How about this? Uh, nope, that's too wide. Nope. How about this one here? There we go. It's bending the motherboard, but I'm just gonna see if that does the trick. Look at that, look at that. It's like magic. You push on it, magically works. Let's see if I pull it out while the disc is animated. Look at that, still working. It's really weird. It seems to affect more the power on than anything else. Ugh. And it's problem is it's just unreliable. Like I'll just wiggle the CPU around in there and we turn it back on, probably it's not gonna work again. Not working. Um, and I think it's, it is the board itself that needs to flex. Let's, uh, let's push on the PCB right there. I'm pushing on the PCB, not the socket. Nope, not, that's not it. How about over on this side? Nope. Okay, how about this? There we go, it's working. <laughs> Those, incidentally, if it's on that side of the, P, the CPU, that was the area that I was reflowing those, those pins. How about on the front part here? Well, now it's freaking working on its own. I'm sh if I just wiggle the CPU around, it'll stop working again. <laughs> ah, just like that. Let's try doing the wedge in the front. Yeah, whatever's going on, it's in the back there. And I just don't have the patience right now to try to fix this thing again. It goes without saying that the proper way to try to fix this board would be to remove the CPU socket, potentially this slot. There's some passive components around. I can't remember what's over here. There's like, I could feel another IC over there. Remove those and the sockets and everything. 
sand off all the solder mask and carefully inspect every single trace. There's just gotta be one where like, there's the trace and the via where like the chip is going through the socket and they must just barely be touching, barely. And any kind of flexing of the board is all it takes to make it work. All right, I'm gonna do a test. I'm gonna push down on the PCB right here, not on the chip itself, but kind of next to it. Oops, I'm using a plastic tool, right? Just in case I uh, don't wanna short anything out. No, actually, look, it's not working. It's, it's, it's gotta be right on the CPU socket. Okay, here we go. I'm just wedged under the caddy there. It's pushing down on the CPU itself. Ah, that did not bring it to life. Let's go back to the brute force method here. All right, the PCB is bending. <laughs> okay, well, I spoke too soon. <laughs> oh, this Amiga. There we go. And here's the thing. Once the system is running, when I have the accelerator board in there, this takes over. And I don't think there's any problem with the CPU slot at all. It's just the initial like bootstrap of the system and then it hands off to this. I think that's what the ROMs on here do. Um, and it's totally stable. Once it's running, it's totally stable if this card were in there. So for now, I know this is a, a bodge of itself. I'm gonna wedge something under here. I gotta find something to just wedge in here and I'm gonna leave it like that until I have time to take apart this machine and do all that sanding I talked about. That's very time consuming. And yeah, unfortunately that is just not in the cards right now. And I just need to use this machine. I just wanna use it. <laughs> it's like, I just need to check those discs and then I gotta work on some other projects. So let me figure out something I can wedge in there. What can I, what can I wedge? What would be good for wedging, wedging action? Hmm. <laughs> this might do the trick. This is an old speaker from one of those Apple IIe's that is dead. And can this get in under there? Yes, this is gonna work, I think. Oh yeah, nice. Okay, so it's a good tight fit. Just move that capacitor out of the way. It's not exerting too much pressure just a little bit here. To be honest, it might not be enough. Let's turn that on, see what happens. Oh, it came up, it came up. So the question is, will it be stable? So for me to test, I'm just gonna bend this whole thing, like, you know, lift it up on the corner and it flexes the motherboard. Flex, 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 push, push, push. Turn that on. Okay, that might be the trick. It's in there good enough, and it's really not pushing on the motherboard. Oh, look at that, I touched it, and it crashed. Let's slide that over a little bit. Okay. Flex, 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 bang, bang, bang. All right, this looks good. I mean, that is a terrible solution. <laughs> Just look at that. Absolutely terrible. <laughs> but you know what? I'm bending it, the computer's not crashing. I think that's gonna do the trick. Oh, this is so terrible. <laughs> so, so terrible. I'm gonna power cycle it one more time. Just as a final test here. Okay, this looks good. Let's start with the accelerator card. Oh yeah, incidentally, this had a lot of corrosion. Look at that. I haven't had to bodge that. There's a little tiny bodge wire right there. And there's actually lacquer painted on top of this copper here. <laughs> One of the fingers there is, is ripped and I had to tin those and yeah, the whole board and this side is bad as well. This is what happens when you leave batteries in, in Amiga 2000s. It ruins things in the slots too. So like I said, don't go buying one of these unless it's been super professionally repaired. There's a high likelihood that it's broken. All right, accelerator screwed in. Let's turn this on. Uh, oh, okay, I was about to go like, oh, it's not working. 
but it is working. Sweet. Okay, so even here at the workbench insertion screen, whatever you call this, this accelerator card is running. So it's running at 25 megahertz with a 68030. So I'm just gonna pop in the rest of these cards now. This RAM card, there's really no point to use this in here because it's got four megs on the accelerator. It's got probably a megabyte on the motherboard. It might have a two meg, one of my 2000s, I can't remember which one it is, has a two megabyte chip RAM plug-in module thing with a new Agnes chip and there's no extra RAM on here. Too much RAM in your Amiga definitely prevents the, Excel, the um, bridge board from working properly. Definitely, that's a problem. Okay, how about with these cards in here? Will you work? Will you not? Nice. You know, it said clean the drives. I'm gonna use this floppy drive cleaning disk here. I don't know if these drives work. I don't remember where I got these. Let's try to clean these up a little bit first. Oh, this one does not eject properly. Okay, that's probably what I meant by clean. And this other one, they're trying to boot. And that doesn't eject properly either. Oh, you know what, it doesn't eject because this has no cover, that's why. These, these Amiga drives, they rely on the spring tension of that little cover to eject the disc for you. All right, let's see, I got some discs here. I think Amiga test kit is in here somewhere. Maybe, maybe. It was not, but here it is, Amiga test kit. Just right protect that. Okay, good, it's booting. So that's a good sign. All right, yes, uh, 68030 and uh, e ECS is e 60 hertz. Sorry about the noise, the air conditioner just turned on. It's a, a warm day here in Portland and since this video is so impromptu, I didn't even bother to shut the AC off like I normally do. Alrighty, let's see here. Memory, how much RAM do we got? Six megs total. So yes, four megs on the accelerator card and I do have two megabytes of chip memory in here. It says two megs chip, four megabyte fast. So that's that's fine. I'm not running crazy applications on this thing. I just, you know, I play around with it, play games and stuff on it. Let's do a quick memory test. All right, it's finished uh, the pass. It's on pass two now. So all the RAM is working, which is excellent. So there we go, I think that was my fix for this Amiga 2000. Let's just power cycle it again. In fact, I'll turn it off and I'll bang it around and we'll turn it back on, see if it still turns on. I mean, that speaker was definitely dead and it came out of an Apple IIe and uh, that's why the cone was sort of torn. And look at that, I used it to fix my Amiga 2000. The crappiest fix there is, but there it is, it booted right back up again. Awesome. <laughs> oh, and incidentally, one more thing before I uh, end this video. This A2091 card that's in here, it seems to struggle with the SCSI SD. If I plug the SCSI SD in the external port, it works, but it gives like weird disk errors randomly. So it's not reliable. Now these cards, of course, are very reliable, you know, when you use hard drives with them. So I don't know what's going on exactly, um, why the, the SCSI SD is not working, but it just doesn't work. And I have more than one of these cards and they both, I think I have three, they all behave exactly the same way. But I like this SCSI card, it's a good SCSI card. If you don't have an accelerator with SCSI built in, like this Commodore one, then this is a great alternative. It supports DMA transfer, so it's pretty fast for like a Zorro 2 16-bit card. And sure enough, I tested these cards with regular SCSI hard drives and they work fine, no errors. But SCSI SD, it just does not work properly on this. So if anyone has any clues to what's going on there, maybe there's a setting on the SCSI to HD that I can change that will improve that compatibility or something, definitely let me know. I'd be very curious to do that. I would much rather use an actual SCSI SD in this thing versus a spinning rust old hard drive that are just super unreliable, plus very noisy. All right, that is it. So uh, <laughs> let me know in the, in the comment section what you thought about my completely craptastic fix on this machine. And I'm sure people are gonna write and tell me that it's a horrible thing. But you know what? Um, it's late. I just finished working on the Amiga 1000, which I don't know when you're gonna see this video, but 
that video is going to be on the main channel and I spent quite a bit of time fixing that thing and putting it back together. It was like a, a jigsaw puzzle and retro brighting. I don't feel like working on any Amigas right now. I just wanted to use this thing as is. So now I can do that. I'm going to get an OS installed on here. I'll probably put a spinning hard drive in there. I'll get an OS on here and then I will test out my floppies, which is exactly what I needed to do. I have a little pile here. There's Digiview. I know that's good. I already tested that. Where in the world is Carmen San Diego test drive works, but then there's some other stuff like the clue and Pelican program, Pelican one art. I don't know what that stuff is. So I'm going to play around with that. So that's it. Thanks to my patrons. Names are over here. You can become a patron if you, uh, you know, check the link down below, get access to videos early, message me through the platform, a lot easier to get through to me, stuff like that. So yes, it's available down below. Blah, 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 available down below. I'd really appreciate a subscribe on my second channel. It helps me out immeasurably because this second channel gets way less views than the main one and um, ad revenue is less on it even, even for the same number of views, all that stuff. So anyway, subscribes really help there. And that is that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye.